What do Mormons believe about the plurality of gods? Welcome, this is People of the Free Gift, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. If you're new to the channel, go ahead and subscribe to see. make sure you don't miss any future content related to cults and how to share the gospel with them. We are going to be going through some material that I shared in my book, Sharing Jesus with the Cults, available on Amazon as paperback or Kindle. And we're going through the most popular content on this YouTube channel related to cults and how to share the gospel with them. And the most popular video by far is our LDS Plan of Salvation video. And we have other videos on Mormonism in a playlist that um, will be in the description down below if you want to know more about that. And some of the videos, as we break this down, have already the topics have already been covered. But this week we're going to be focusing on the, the key main topics that I wanted to address. And we're going to be doing it by going to LDS.org and seeing what the official content says. And then we're also going to be going to Mormon Doctrine by Bruce McConkie. And uh, I cut my teeth very early on, on in Mormonism on this. He's a former apostle who has since uh, passed away in the Mormon Church. And um, he didn't pull any punches. And so we're going to see what he says in the scriptures he points to to back up his claim of what what the, the Mormon Church teaches about plurality of gods. And uh, so let's go ahead and jump in. And uh, so what is the nature of God is the name of the article I found when I just typed in, you know, multiple gods or um, plurality of gods on the LDS website. And uh, subtitle, God knows each of us personally. He loves us and hears and answers our prayers. By learning to be more like him, we can live with him again. So, who among us hasn't asked such essential questions as where did I come from, why am I here, and what will happen when I die? Understanding God's nature and his work allows us to answer these questions by providing us with reasonable, profound insight into our Heavenly Father and into ourselves. The vast family of humankind was created with divine potential and in the image of our Father who wants his children to thrive to become like him and to return to live with him. Now, breaking down the terminology, and we're going to have another video later this week on the terminology you need to know in relation to Mormonism, but I just want to break down this language because they're very good at using Christianese and non-offensive terms that sound good enough to the Christian mind, but I want to break these terms down. So, Heavenly Father, when they say that they are referring to the God in which we worship, who they believe is named Elohim, and they mean Heavenly Father in the most literal sense that you can say it, that he literally gave birth to us as spirit children in what they call the pre-existence, that we are born first as spirit children and then sent to this earth and to get our mortal bodies so that we can progress in one day, return to be with him and like him, meaning that we will one day potentially become gods ourselves and be heavenly father to another batch of spirit children who will worship us on another, uh, another uh, existence and planet. And so that's what they mean when they say heavenly father and uh, when they say that we are created with divine potential because we are God's literal spirit children, we are referred to as gods in embryo. Uh, and that is what our, um, and the image of our Father, when we get our earth, earthly mortal bodies, they believe God has a body of flesh and bones, just as tangible as man's. And, and so that is the image that we are created in. And we are returned to live with him, meaning that uh, we, we will become like him and we will become gods ourselves. We instinctively desire the same thing. We long for a reunion with the home and family we can't quite remember. The idea of God as our Father is not allegorical, it is literal. So they're honest about that. Our mortal bodies are remarkable scientific wonders and works of art. They are widely diverse mortal bodies patterned after God's own glorified immortal body, as indicated in Genesis 126, when God says, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. And Moses also wrote of having seen God and talking to him face to face as a man speaks unto his friend, which, of course, is um, personification. Uh, something that they do in animation with animals and they make them more human. They, we do the same thing with God in order to understand him better. Exodus thirty-three eleven. It's interesting, if you go to Exodus 33, right after it says that, uh, Moses asked to see God 
Um, and then God says, if you were to see me, you would die instantly. So I will pass by and you can look at my backside, which shows us that this is allegorical or metaphorical language when it speaks of be speaking face to face with him. No man has ever seen God and lived, but he is made embodied that in the image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ. So the New Testament likewise reveals Jesus Christ to have been begotten by God and created in his image during his life on earth. So you get to the New Testament likewise reveals Jesus Christ to have been begotten by God and created in his image. He is a spirit child just like us. He's just the firstborn spirit child. So he was chosen as the savior of the world and progressed his way to be a uh, God just like us. But he is not distinct and he is not, has not always been God according to the LDS church. And when it says he was begotten by God on this earth, when it says he's the only begotten of God, they mean that in the most literal sense that God, heavenly father, plus Mary equals your father and your mother equals you. Is that clear enough? <clears throat> the New Testament, okay. During his life on earth, Christ's earthly body, which looked like ours, reflected this parentage. We are like our father and his son, whose combined work is to help us achieve eternal, exalted life with them in heaven. And then it goes on, we have divine parentage and potential. Understanding God's nature is important because it helps us better understand our potential. Heavenly Father is the all-powerful creator and ruler of the universe, but he is also patient, paternal, merciful, and devoted to our eternal progression. For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Moses 139. God is not abstract or incomprehensible. Indeed, we should all strive to come to know him and his son in this life. Building a relationship with God can begin in prayer and, like any meaningful relationship, requires sincere effort. Whether our prayers are said out loud or conveyed silently through the mind and heart, they present opportunities for us to communicate directly with our divine creator. He hears and answers our prayers sometimes in various obvious ways and sometimes through impressions, promptings, and feelings of peace. We can better recognize his influence and his voice by reading the scriptures and studying the words of his prophets. And then it has the first and greatest commandment is this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Loving God means keeping his commandments, which are given to help us become more like him. But the problem with that is that 1 John four eighteen says that you cannot love God if you also fear him, and specifically his eternal punishment, his torment, his judgment. And so if you do not know that you are forgiven, then you are unable to love God, which means you are unable to keep his commandments. And if you believe that you have to keep his commandments in order to be saved and have forgiveness of sins, then there's no way out. You must first know you are forgiven in order to love God, in order to keep his commandments. To become like him, we must make choices by using our God-given agency. Sometimes those choices lead us away from God and keeping his commandments. Though through the atonement of his son, Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to sincerely repent, a process that does more than anything else to bring us closer to God. He doesn't expect us to be perfect, only to seek after perfection continually. And while God is a separate person with an exalted body, he is as one with Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost in purpose and in character. We refer to them collectively as the Godhead. We begin our prayers by addressing God the Father, and then we close in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost bears witness of truth, prompts us to make righteous decisions, and comforts us. God won't always take away our struggles, but he will make us strong enough to endure them, giving us insight and peace, and reminding us that we are not alone. God often works through others. He often works through us. In doing so, he reminds us that we are united as his people. So now let's go to Bruce McConkie and his Mormon Doctrine book. And in the, in the article called Plurality of Gods, he links it to these following topics. Adam-God theory, Christ, false gods, Father in heaven, Godhood, Godhead, Godhood, Holy Ghost, polytheism. Three separate personages, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, comprise the Godhead. 
as each of these persons is a God, it is evident from this standpoint alone that a plurality of gods exist. I'm wondering how they would respond now if I were to pull out Isaiah 43.10 that says that there is only one God. There is no God created before him or after him. He is the only God that he knows about. He is the Alpha and the Omega. To, uh, to us, speaking in the proper to finite sense, these three are the only gods we worship. But still, they believe in three gods and they worship three gods. I want you to hear that clearly. But in addition, there is an infinite number of holy personages drawn from worlds without number who have passed on to exaltation and are thus gods. Paul taught, There be gods many and lords many, adding that to us there, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 7, and Doctrine and Covenants 1, 21, 28 through 32. The prophet commenting on this passage said, Paul had no allusion to the heathen gods. I have it from God and get over it if you can. I have a witness of the Holy Ghost and a testimony that Paul had no allusion to the heathen gods in the text. Teachings, page 371. The prophet also taught and explaining God, John's statement and has made us kings and priests in the God and his father. Revelation 1, six that there is a God above the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ was the son of God and John discovered that God, the father of Jesus Christ, had a father, you may suppose that he had a father also. Where was there ever a son without a father? And where was there ever a father without first being a son? Whenever did a tree or anything spring into existence without a progenitor? And everything comes in this way. Paul says that which is earthly is in the likeness of that which is in heavenly. Hence, if Jesus had a father, can we not believe that he had a father also? Teachings, pages 370 and 373. Indeed, this doctrine of plurality of gods is so comprehensive and glorious that it reaches out and embraces every exalted personages. Those who attain exalt exaltation are gods. Go and read the vision in the Book of Covenants, the prophet said. There is clearly illustrated glory upon glory, one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and a glory of the stars. And as one star differs from one other star in glory, even so do the, of the celestial world differ in glory, and every man who reigns in celestial glory is a god to his dominions. They who obtain a glorious resurrection from the dead are exalted far above principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, and angels, and are expressly declared to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, all having eternal power. Teachings, page 374. So there you have it. That's what the Mormons believe about God and the plurality of gods. If there are insights or questions that you have related to this topic, or any others related to cults and sharing the gospel with them, please share those in the comments down below. I'll be choosing some for next week's weekly Q&A. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up if you like the content for today. And share this video with others who are interested in the cults and how to share the gospel with them. And I talked about an announcement at the end of this video, and so it's pertaining to our study through the Bible material. It's going to stay on this channel, the material we have so far, but I have created another channel where I've uploaded all those videos separately onto those, and all future content related to the Bible is going to be on that channel, and that's going to leave this channel ability to be exclusive to material related to cults and how to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if you like the cult material, just stay here. If you like the cult material and the Bible material, I'm going to be providing links in the description, the cards, and the end screen in which you can hop on over there and subscribe to that channel and not miss any future content related to that. And so until next time, may God's grace be with you.